and word goes round the kibbutz, Toscanini is sitting in the dining hall. <laughs> so everybody drops what they're doing, and in their blue overalls, they dash to the dining room and they surround Human and Toscanini and they start asking them technical questions about music because some of them, you know, are is. professional people. <laughs> Toscanini, you know, answers each other. And, and he turns to Huberman and he says, ah, he says, this is a marvelous country. He says, in this country, even the peasants know music. Hello everyone, my name is Oren Kiviti and here is Sharon Kiviti, my sister. And in the first of our interviews about Ruth, our mum, I'm delighted to be able to introduce Norman Lebrecht. Norman is an author and a broadcaster and the founder of Slip Disc, the online portal about music and related arts that has over 2 million visitors a day. Norman knew Ruth for many years before she died and in fact gave a eulogy at her funeral. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Sharon. Norman, it's just great to have you here with us and uh, as a friend of our mothers and as a friend of the family. So we want to talk to you about Ruth and your memories of her. How did you meet Ruth and what was she up to at the time? I think I was first in touch with her about 1970. I was working for the radio in Jerusalem and I was part of a team that was starting the Israeli equivalent of the Today program. They'd never had a news program first thing in the morning before. And um, and she was one of the first to jump on board. I mean, she was in London and she was very keen to to be um, to be part of uh, of our be one of our one of our correspondents and I thought gosh that's very keen indeed because it would have been five in the morning her time <laughs> that she would have been coming on <laughs> but she was uh, she was an absolute um professional as a journalist and as a broadcaster you asked her for one minute 30 you got one minute 30 not 129 not 131 uh, she was terrific she was on the button she was happy to do live she was happy to do recording when you called her or called your father Nisim, they were always first of all very friendly and and then you know very professional very much on the board so after um uh, having known them for, for a while, I came back to London in 1972. I didn't quite know, you know where my life was going to go at that point. I was 24 years old. I, um, I was just starting. I, you know, I'd, had, I'd had success as a journalist in Israel. I wanted to try things out in another country, see how things were in the wider world. Um, Realise that once you come to London, to the big city, any experience that you've had in a faraway country counts for nothing. So you start again from scratch. Um, and I had about three or four months where I wasn't doing very much. And she sat me down. She sat me down with it. Um, and she said, you, you, you get yourself a job. Doesn't matter what it is. Just get yourself a job. You can't have a gap on your CV. <laughs> and, uh, but I took her advice to heart and and it was given with friendship and with love. And I think it's in a certain way, yeah, she put me back on track. But she also um, served as something of a role model as to how to be a writer, how to write books. Um, the first thing you saw in the house on the right hand side, you saw the row of books that she'd written. And then she would talk to you about the one she was writing at the time. And it was always a biography. Her application was maximal. Um, she nothing daunted her when she did the biography of Chopin, which in some ways I think may have been her best and most important book. When she wrote the biography of Chopin, she thought herself Polish. I mean, why wouldn't you? <laughs> but, <laughs> but in learning Polish and and in learning Polish, she was then able to go back to the original letters of Chopin and find them absolutely seeded with the most foul anti-Semitic epithets, which had been carefully weeded out from English and French translations, mysteriously. Um, 
And so she was able to present a very different portrait of Chopin in, in her biography. So she was tremendously thorough and she stopped at nothing and she believed in her craft. She stands in my mind as this very determined woman, very dedicated writer, very good friend, very good mother. I remember the two of you when you were small. Um, and altogether, you know, one of one of the pillars of my life. I mean, she wasn't Ruth; she was Ruthie, obviously. Yes, um, she was and Ruthie. and she was, um, w- which was the diminutive, the Hebrew diminutive of Ruth, in the time when she grew up. And she told me an awful lot about Israel Palestine in those years, the nineteen twenties, the nineteen thirties. I remember any number of stories. Um, and just the other day on YouTube, I was looking for something, and up popped um, the Arik Einstein song with her name in it. Um, I can't remember what the song is called, but there is a line. And, you know, Ruti, if it's Ruti, then that's got to be your mum. That's got to be Ruti. I didn't know. I've never known any other. Yes, Mm -hmm. yes. Well, those are lovely memories, uh, Norman. And I was going to ask you a couple of questions about her books, but I think I'll come back to that. What I wanted to go on to, because you're sharing such beautiful memories of her. Have you got any particular anecdotes you'd like to share with us about Ruti, our mum, your friend? No no particular anecdotes because she was always so focused. She didn't didn't do gossip. She didn't digress. She dealt with the heart of the matter and then moved on. Um, I don't... She was pretty ascetic um, in her tastes and in her habits. I don't think she wasted any time shopping. Um, <laughs> that wasn't her thing. I, I, I think, you know, I think if she needed something, um, she'd probably ask someone to get it for her. But window shopping would, would have been completely alien to her. She'd grown up in a, in a very frugal society. Yes. And she didn't believe that you should spend money on material goods. She also had um, no concern at all with religion. She was um, she was completely secular, um, and and so she she just um, our 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 conversations are engaged. I don't remember long conversations on the phone with her. You know, we talk, and then it would be over. Um, I would come to dinner and 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 then there would, you know there'd be a certain looking at the watch and <laughs> at 10 o'clock <laughs> at 10 o'clock you know when we go back to the district line um, yes and, That's very, very um, true, yes she 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 ran her life and probably your lives um on quite stringent lines i don't think she had great humor i don't remember her telling a joke ever um i don't remember any great play on words um but she was um as well as being a very good writer she was extremely musical Mm. um she was immersed in music and she loved discussing music and so that probably took up a fair bit of her conversation and she, I, I mean, I always felt she was just incredibly encouraging and supportive. It was not an easy decision for somebody in their mid twenties um, to focus on writing books at that time. Um, it was a pretty tough economy and particularly writing books in the arts and about the arts was not what the market seemed to be crying out for. But Roti was always, yeah, go for it, you know. Yeah, do, you know, that's that's if that's what you believe in, yeah, just just do it. Do it the best you can, it'll be fine. And sometimes it was. Great. Well thank you, Norman. I'd like to, because you're talking about um, her encouragement of you with mm. uh, your books, 
Uh, you've mentioned her um, slightly controversial biography of Chopin because she um, introduced some topics that had been sort of wiped off history. Um, boot, she, yes. also wrote, she also wrote about um, the 19th century French Jewish composer Halevi, and I know you've got some things you'd like to share with us about that. But just before you do, I'd like to stress to our audience and listeners uh, that she was writing in a second language. She was writing in English, which was her second yep. language, yep. which is, again, something marvellous. So anyway, uh, Norman, could you share with us something about Halevi? She was writing in English, which was her second language, and she was researching in Polish and in French. Um, yes. So that was pretty good. And then I think when she wrote Berenice, she, I think she learned Latin. I think she learned Latin. So she... She absolutely went the extra mile um, when she was writing these books. Alevi, um, Alevi is a fascinating character for all sorts of reasons. Uh, he was um, the first French Jew to have an operatic success. And the success was huge. And the theme was Jewish. It was called La Juive. And um, it was... It was immense. I mean, it was performed everywhere, all the way, all across Europe and in the United States. Um, it was a, a fixture at most of the major opera houses until um, until the 1920s. It started to tail off, and then, with the rise of Nazism in Germany, it vanished almost completely. I don't, as far as I know. There hasn't been a professional production of La Juive in London since the war. Um, I may be mistaken. I may have missed something, but I can't remember one. Um, it requires three lyric tenors, which are not easy to find and not cheap. Yeah. And it is long, as grand operas tended to be. But it's it's unbelievably influential, and Alevi himself was very influential. Um, apart from La Juive, he was a complete failure. He, every, he was forever, he was a professor of the Conservatoire in Paris, and he kept skipping classes because he was running off to the different theatre managers, trying to persuade them to take up his latest opera, which he'd written at home and which nobody wanted to perform. So La Juive was his, was his one great work. But among his students, I mean, he raised the whole of the next generation of French composers, Saint-Saëns and um, Alcan and so many others. Bizet, and most importantly, Bizet. Bizet was the, the son he never had. So Ruti's book on Alevi was a breakthrough. Um, there, there had never been a book on Alevi in English. There are not that many in French. Um, because of his sunken reputation uh, for the past 90 years, there is um, very few publishers who were prepared to take on a project that dealt with a composer who has been quite completely forgotten. And yet she dedicated years and language studies and music studies um, to the pursuit of this minor but very important composer, yes. Jacques Romain de Thank you. And in fact, as she was um, in her her final months, she was putting the finishing touches, even though she was very... That I, that I, yeah. Yep, to yep. No, no, that's, that I remember. That I remember. I mean, and, and I remember her saying to me, I'm going to finish this. I'm going to, you know, my last book, I'm going to finish this. It was, yes. it was really, really important. And it was important to me. Mm. I, I'd love to add something to this conversation because... Uh, I remember mum used to say to us, I want to write one more book before I die. And then she started this book and then she was diagnosed with cancer. And, and mm -hmm. as, as you know, she passed away. But she passed away on March the 17th, which was Halevi's birthday. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So uh, it was uh, no, ironic. I, yes, yeah. it was, yeah. yes, it was. Now you mentioned it. I remember that. Yeah. Yes, it's extraordinary. Yeah. I'd like yeah. to now go to Daughter of the Waves, um, mm. which... For us, relaunching it, republishing it next year is, is a kind of personal dream because she dedicated it to us. And also, of course, her history of growing up 
uh, that in her childhood memories is part of our heritage. But it's also far more than that. It kind of goes hand in hand with the birth of a new country, Eretz Israel. And I wondered yeah. how you feel about Daughter of the Waves. I know you read it and you loved it at the time and what you feel, maybe your hopes and expectations about the relaunch next year. It, it was um, it was phenomenally illuminating for me. Um, uh, it was living history. Um, she grew up, but Galim is Daughter of the Waves, is um, just outside Haifa. So she grew up on the Mediterranean and she saw villages turn into towns. Um, she saw tremendous growth as a child and as a teenager. Her father, I think, laid the first electrical grid across Galilee, brought, brought electricity to, to the north of the land of Israel, or so she told me. Um, she didn't know that. She, she, felt, she felt part of a pioneering generation, um, and she felt a need to record that. And I just remember there were certain details that she told me, some of which she put in the book. Um, I mean, she remembered um, the formation of the Palestine Symphony Orchestra and Toscanini coming to conduct them. Yes. And I said to her, where did you hear the first concert? Because did they go to Haifa? They may have gone to Haifa. But where she remembered hearing the first concert was in a cafe, because the cafe had the only radio in Haifa. <laughs> there was only one radio set in the major port city at that time, and everybody converged on that on the cafe in order to hear the Toscanini concert. And the other story, of course, that she told terribly well was was when uh, Toscanini and Huberman, the violinist who had organised the orchestra, had got caught in the first rains, and they were driving from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And as you know, when the first rains come in Israel. Um, it rains. I mean, you do you yes. do not drive. You get off the road and you get off fast and you wait however long it takes, an hour, two hours, three hours. So they pulled off the road into a, a new settlement. There were no paved roads. They were sinking in mud. And it was it was a new kibbutz of, of um, refugees from Germany. Um, this would have been 1936. And yes. they were living in tents, and there was just one tin shack in the middle, which was the dining hall. And so Huberman and Toscanini went into the tin shack, and they served them coffee or whatever, and they're sitting there talking this and that. And word goes round the kibbutz, Toscanini is sitting in the dining hall. <laughs> so everybody drops what they're doing, and in their blue overalls, they dash to the dining room and they surround Huberman and Toscanini and they start asking them technical questions about music because some of them, you know, they're oh, yes. professional people and academics and intellectuals and musicians from all over Germany who have been forced out of their own country. And then they say, oh, Maestro, 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 in, in, in Die Reuka Symphony, in second movement, uh, rehearsal number 42, is that an E sharp? Is that an E flat? And, Toscanini you know, answers each other, and he turns to Huberman and he says, ah, he says, this is a marvelous country. He says, in this country, even the peasants know music. <laughs> <laughs> and that was one of mum's anecdotes. Well, Norman, that's really given us a flavor of, uh, you, you know, your memories, your friendship, uh, your professional relationship with our mother, Ruth. Um, and also your thoughts about Daughter of the Waves. And we're so, so thrilled to have had you here today. So thank you so much, Norman. It's my pleasure. And I, I, I don't want to leave without mentioning your father as well, because Nisim was, Nisim was a great figure. Nisim was the leading sports commentator in Israel. And um, I knew them, you know, both together and separately. Um, and I um, have you know, very strong and fond memories of Nisim and and of his life and of his career. And he is still alive, which I'm so delighted to hear. Yes. Mm. Well, I'd like to say thank you as well very much. Um, it's really great to see you again after so many years. Uh, and 
for our viewers, uh, of course, there's more information about Georgia of the Waves and gonna, there's going to be a link below that you can click if you'd like to find out more and to uh, get regular updates about the book project. And we're looking forward to publishing in April 2023. So thank you all very much for watching and thank you once again, Norman, for your wonderful contribution. My pleasure. It's, it, it really is a pleasure to remember with you.